In most of the battery tests that are now set up in psychology, the Rorschach test is included. This test consists of presenting the subject with a series of ink blot designs or designs based upon the original ink blot concept. Usually a piece of paper was taken and folded and with a very soft and flowing pen some word or signature was written along the fold. Then without blotting the two pieces of paper were brought together and part of the design appeared on the opposite fold. When this was opened up, it resulted in a more or less symmetrical pattern. Very often this was enlarged or amplified by various devices, but the patterns were nearly always symmetrical, that is, similar on the two vertical sides of the pattern. This type of testing presented the subject with a series of comparatively meaningless blots. But very seldom did the subject ever leave them meaningless. He began to interpret what he saw. Well, in a good many cases, these ink blots did form uh, rather interesting designs, frequently with close resemblance uh, to some familiar object. Very often, however, the subject rejected the familiar object interpretation entirely. And if you showed the ink blot to a hundred different persons, you would get a great number of different explanations of what it looked like. To some, this ink blot would, re blot would resemble simply a mask or face made symmetrical by the two sides having been uh, blotted one upon the other. To another person this block took on a very strange morbid meaning. One individual saw the laughing clown's face and another a death head in exactly the same example. The point we want to make out of all of this is that unknown designs patterns for which no fixed interpretation is given are subject to interpretation by the person viewing them, examining them. And this interpretation comes essentially from within himself. Seldom, if ever, does it actually arise from a factual level of understanding. The mere circumstance that the thing is mysterious or unlabeled takes away certainty and gives freer expression to our imagination. The person looking at the Rorschach ink blot is quite aware of these certainties or these circumstances. He is not likely to be greatly deceived. He knows he is being tested. And if he is entirely honest and wishes to cooperate, he will describe uh, the figures or designs which are most apparent to him. Not long ago, an art exhibit was held in one of our communities of rather, um, I would say, not too good art. Uh, those who came to see it were invited to make their selection of the best picture. Write it on a slip of paper and deposit it in a box. The purpose being to get some concept of public taste or perhaps to influence the final balloting for an award that was to be given. When the ballots were examined afterwards of the hundreds of persons that had come in to see this particular exhibition, uh, the choices were so diversified that someone had considered each picture as the best. No one asked which one was the worst. It would have produced exactly the same type of circumstance. 
to someone, each picture would also have been the worst. In the understanding of this, we therefore have to realize that what we call taste may not be merely a gracious standard of psychological understanding. Taste is really an expression of certain pressures and instincts within ourselves. All these tests lead to the ethical conclusion that the individual lives in a world which he interprets very largely according to his own internal pressure. As world is mystery, as other people are mysterious, so we are forever imposing an interpretation upon them. This interpretation becomes more complicated if we come under psychic stress. The most obvious normal thing to do in the Rausha testing or in other, any other test is that the person should see the object in its most obvious and evident shape and form. If the object to a small child, to a hundred children, would all look like a bird, or would seem to be a bird to all of them. It would mean that the ink blot, in its own formation, actually approached the general appearance of a bird. It would be the natural conclusion, the obvious conclusion. If, therefore, the person comes to that conclusion, with the majority who agree with him, then he may be regarded as not under any particular or peculiar distortion. But if he comes to some entirely contrary conclusion, one in which others cannot see the slightest resemblance between the ink blot and what he feels it to mean, then we suspect that he is under some rather peculiar pressure. Now let's bring this down uh, to a more personal level. We each of us have persons around us. Each of us also has unfinished business on various levels of conduct. Most of this unfinished business has a mystery about it because we do not know exactly how it is going to come out. We plan, we hope, we prepare, but we are never certain until certain things happen. Thus we are under a certain natural stress or tension. Then with persons, uh, we gradually come to realize that we cannot simply look at the person and decide what he is. We come to, the know, to know that his kindly look may or may not be supported by his temperament. We realize that his word may be his bond and it may be worthless. He tells us that he is most sincere in his regard, but we are not certain. Later we may learn that we have been deceived and imposed upon. Thus, out of gradual experience, we come to the conclusion that we cannot entirely accept people. We cannot entirely say to ourselves, this man says he's good, therefore he is good. When we start saying that now, we're liable to be poorer rather quickly thereafter. <laughs> Thus, the definition, the signboard, the name, which would make all things obvious, cannot be hung on things anymore as uh, a certain label of their meaning or value. We see articles with guarantees. We do not trust the guarantees anymore. We hear that a certain product is of superior quality. We do not believe it anymore. Thus, the more common ways in which we are, came to conclusions have failed, and everything we are in contact with takes on the element of mystery. What is it really worth? 
What does it really represent? What does this other person really think? Is this political party really progressive? And all these doubts throw us away from the ability to make simple acceptances or rejections. Each of these uncertainties lures a psychic content out of ourselves. Each one of these problems and each of these people becomes in its own turn a sort of Rorschach test. A test in which we are constantly trying to penetrate into meaning, trying to discover the answer to a puzzle, the puzzle of value, the puzzle of integrity, the puzzle of character, as represented in other objects and persons, and having no true scale by which to measure these uncertainties. We do not measure them in, at all. We simply impose our own psychic life upon them. As soon as we do this, we reveal not what they are, but what we are. Once this has been accomplished, we begin to treat these other objects or persons according to our own expectancy of them. If we have decided they were bad, we proceed to dislike them. If we decide that they are good, we proceed to like them. This in turn may lead to a series of deceits. We may discover the persons that we did not like were really admirable persons. Whereas our selection of the persons we do like may be so weakened by our own psychology that we select the worst of all people and are very soon uh, injured or disillusioned by their actions. Having been disillusioned, we then turn upon these other persons, completely oblivious to the fact that we have empowered them to do this to us. We are the ones that have invested these other persons with virtues which perhaps they never claimed or with temperaments which they never possessed or imagined that they possessed. But if these expectations of our own do not work out, then they are to blame. We are miserable. The bottom is out of our moral and ethical universe. It consequently comes to our attention, rather forcibly these days, that this projection of ourselves, our internal content, upon exterior objects can be dangerous. It can lead us to a whole series of disasters, and is perhaps merely another manifestation of the operation of the law of cause and effect in nature. The individual who has not organized his own life projects disorder upon everything around him, then must live under the disorder which he has projected. The moment we have decided what something is, we act accordingly and set up a new series of relationships. We give this thing which we have defined and perhaps almost created, the right to have certain distinct reactions upon us. We are open uh, to all of the reversals of emotion and thought which arise from a wrong estimation in the first place. This wrong estimation would not have been possible had we possessed the facts. But in very few problems do we possess the facts. What we call a fact is our own interpretation of the subject. The person reading one of his own designs into a Rorschach block, ink plot is perfectly certain that he has read into that its real meaning. The next person coming to an entirely different conclusion, is quite certain that that is the real meaning. 
until the analyst in the end finally comes to conclude that for very few persons is the real meaning of anything evident. That what we know as real meaning is our own personal reaction. Unreal meaning is someone else's reaction. This reaction is obviously false because it does not agree with ours, and ours is real. This can go on to infinity without any real grounds for moderation or for common understanding or for mutual respect on these decisions. This again merely tells us the tremendous power of our own psychic integration uh, to influence our estimation of values. It does not mean that this integration actually causes us to change anything else. The person whom we interpret according to our interpretation, is not actually changed in any way by what we think about them. There might be some ethical modification if this person feels that we have unusual confidence in them, they might rise to that confidence or try to. Or if we dislike them, they might make no effort to be pleasant. These generalities can follow. But essentially, our attitude toward anything makes no essential change in that thing. The painting at the exhibition was no better and no worse because we liked it or disliked it. It remained whatever it was. Because we have no means of changing these things, the relationships which are set up from our own interpretation of something else means that our own attitude is reflected back upon us from this thing up upon which we have bestowed an interpretation. We are immediately affected by this in the term of our own preconception. It must be what we expect it to be. And the most terrible disaster of all is the discovery that our expectancy is wrong. This strikes us at the root because it assails our own egoism. The idea that we could be wrong is so abhorrent to us that we will use every device possible to relieve ourselves of this morbid possibility. To do this, we continue to heap responsibility, guilt, or blame upon the other object. Convinced that we have been right in the first place, and therefore that this other person must have some strange magical power to change itself or himself so as to hurt us or to bring us misery or loss. If this is a fact, and we know that it is a fact, the greatest of all of the Russia ink blots that we have to work with is the world itself, the universe, the atomic age, uh, the pressures of industry, our continual impact with things that are pleasant or unpleasant, our interpretation of radio and television programs, our interpretation of music and art, our interpretation of the newspaper, of crime, of all kinds of activities. All these interpretations arise in us and while there are certain moral truths involved in all of these problems, it is surprising to the degree that we can completely overlook the facts. The person who is under any psychic pressure or tension 
has a tendency to evade facts. Because the end of all fact is to bring our lesson back to ourselves, and that's where we do not want it to be. So we have a skill, an incredible skill, in justifying our own misinterpretations of the things that happen to us. We justify by means of a certain dishonesty in our own natures. And wherever there is psychic pressure, there is some degree of dishonesty, conscious or unconscious. The individual who is under tension simply is not honest. This doesn't mean he will steal anything or that he will intentionally break a law. But it means he is not honest in the estimation of his own relationships with other things or even his relationships with himself. The moment we find pressure, we find antagonisms, we find criticism, we find uh, an uh, antagonism between ideas, which is just as difficult as between persons. We find conflict and prejudice. We find intolerance, and we come upon these things working to hurt persons, and they do not realize that they are suffering from these ailments. They honestly believe that they see the thing as it is. Now, if uh, you were to go to a series of battery tests on something, and you took ten tests, to determine, for instance, a degree of natural optimism. And if in these ten tests, in each instance, your interpretation followed a pessimistic trend, in other words, if you always saw a negative in a symbol, if a symbol always became a cause of fear or regret, or doubt, or antagonism, or depression, and you went through this battery of tests and came to the end of it, you might say to yourself, that's rather funny, here are all kinds of things that really have no meaning in themselves at all, and they all look unpleasant to me. You might even say to yourself, I'm beginning to suspect there might be something wrong with me. It's conceivable. Because this is such a nice, neat little scientific package, I have no way, essentially, of evading the fact that I've come to very negative conclusions. But if the same person out in life, going through the years, comes to a thousand negative conclusions over the period of entire lifetime, and lives the whole of his career, emphasizing negation and cheerfully overlooking anything good. It doesn't occur to him that there's a thing wrong with him. It's just the fact the world isn't as good as it used to be. And he wishes he had those good old days 40 years ago, and he forgets he was just as miserable then. But because now it is no longer in the laboratory, and it's out in life, and it's with people and objects and a kaleidoscopic mingling of values, he no longer considers it likely that his own vision is astigmatic in any way. Now it is just the fact that life is that way, just plain miserable. He should take a hint from others for he sees around him every day persons going through the same general types of experiences that he is going through. They do not seem to be miserable. At least some of them do not. He finds persons enjoying things he dislikes. This has no general effect upon him. These other people simply have no sense or they have bad taste. It's still the fact that he is a really serious fellow He's thought it all through carefully, and he's come to the conclusion that everything is wrong. And if you try to tell him to the contrary, you are wrong, and join the great circle 
of things against which he builds defenses. Out of all of these psychological testings, therefore, we come to certain general, common, human facts, which can be a great deal of help to us. Suppose we also now say that the person who sees things wrong all the time has to have something negative inside, something terribly lacking in normal optimism. Let us also say that the person even becomes aware of this, but he sort of sits down opens his hands and his lap and says, what can I do about it? How can I change the fact that this is the way it really seems to be? Everything I come in contact with proves again and again that my worst suspicions are correct. You can sit down and talk with these persons and sometimes, in a few instances, where you have one of commanding intellectual ability, you may be able to convince them that it has been a bad matter of perspective, that they simply lost sight of the values in things. But you can seldom, if ever, talk a human being out of a good, solid emotional despondency. Not only is he unwilling to change, he is unable to change. His very despondency has destroyed his own psychic power of recuperation. And if you finally do convince him that he is wrong, then he collapses more than ever. And he may turn to you with the saddest of all expressions and say, well, if I'm wrong, then I've always been wrong. Now I've wasted a whole life being wrong, and I feel worse finding this out than I did before. You can't, uh, you can't win against a good, solid, negative determination to be miserable. <laughs> Yet if you ask these persons if they want to be miserable, they say, of course not. Who does? We want to be happy, but we can't find anything that justifies our hope that we ever will be happy. And then will come perhaps the unloading of the sad story uh, of the dozen or half dozen disasters in life by means of which our hope for happiness has been destroyed. Yet we have to go on living and the uh, problem of continuing in a state of perpetual misery is not very intriguing or very optimistic. Persons, therefore, who have these kinds of problems sometimes have to enter into a little conspiracy with themselves about their own problem. What we feel, how we interpret, how we react, all of these reflexes, to a measure at least, depend upon a psychic chemistry within ourselves a chemistry which assumes alchemical, mystical proportions. We are not of the attitude which we presently hold because of one faculty, one emotional instinct, one habit, or one degree of understanding, or even as the result of one problem. All that we are inside is a compound consisting of numerous elements brought together to form a unit or an integration, a bundle made up of numerous sticks or twigs or materials held together with a string, a string which in this case represents the intellectual coordination. Being therefore of our present mood, because of a confusion of complicated circumstances, it is almost useless to head into this mood, decide that it is wrong, and resolve to defeat it if it requires our last ounce of energy. It will, 
and we will still uh, not be victorious. If, as we are beginning to recognize pretty seriously nowadays, this person who does the judging, who passes judgment upon the forms presented by the Rorschach inkblots, if this person uh, was one faculty, one power, one emotion, one point of view, we could head into it hard and perhaps break through it and relieve the pressure. But this pressure arises from as many mysteries on the inside as the reaction arises from mysteries on the outside. The person going down into himself does not find a hard core of pressure. The cause of pressure slowly disappears from his awareness when he seeks to explore it. He gets further and further in and comes finally to a kind of hole in the dark. And out of this hole in the dark these pressures are pouring. But he can never get at their cause. He can never find out just exactly what thing he did that sets all this pressure mechanism into action. The reason he cannot find the single cause is the fact that there is not a single cause. A series of conditions have all worked together to produce a reaction focus. Now this focus in its turn may uh, be affected by single causes. The individual going out in life seeking to build a home may have a marriage uh, with a person whom they were emotionally drawn to and in three months the marriage is on the rocks. Now the marriage going on the rocks and the circumstances relating to it can cause an obvious center of pressure. This center of pressure may in turn result in fear or resentment and cause the person's emotional life to be upset for the rest of his present embodiment. This can happen. But the shock of the bad marriage was not the cause of the situation or the condition. The real cause lay in the type of persons drawn together. And this drawing together on a certain level arose from the pressure integrations of the involved individuals. The bad choice in the first place, perhaps against the advice of those who knew better, perhaps even against the recognition within ourselves that it could be a mistake, perhaps inspired by an ulterior motive, a girl simply wanting to get away from home, perhaps one looking for only economic support, any one of a dozen ulterior motives can do it. But behind the bad marriage, there was bad integration. There was something wrong. The marriage itself, going bad afterwards, results in a new chain of circumstances. But the original cause was much deeper than an incident. One of the simplest things you can say about it was that somebody misjudged someone else. It was a mistaken case of judgment. And a mistaken case of judgment in this type of problem is too often the same thing that we have mentioned. The individual simply seeing himself reflected from another person. Under emotional pressure also, where the rational factors are not as active as they may be in other levels of thinking, it is particularly easy to let psychic pressure take over. And the individual forms violent attachments or antagonisms, which have no actual grounds in fact, reality, or common sense. To go further then, we have the person who is moving out from a kind of compound within himself. A compound composed of at least 40 mental emotional factors. In addition to these, numerous other 
hypermental factors going far back and deep about which we have very little knowledge today. But suddenly out of this entire compound comes the personality to which we conveniently attach the label Joe Dokes. So we meet Joe, and Joe is just a good fellow. Joe is this kind of a fellow and that kind of a fellow. Joe is a fellow that if you treat him pretty decently, will treat you pretty decently. If you uh, kind of agree with him, most of the time he will agree with you once in a while, which is uh, considered liberality. Joe's got a quick temper, but he gets over it quickly. He's a bit of a worrier, but naturally rather cheerful. He likes to work, not very hard, but he will still make a living if he has to. And out of this whole situation comes this sort of general compromise personality, good old Joe, who is like a million other good old Joes. So we come along with this person, and we try to say that this part of his temperament is weak, that part of his temperament is weak, and one of these days he may uh, meet up with some kindly lady who will try to strengthen all his weak points and weaken all his strong points. <laughs> this uh, is in order to make something really worthwhile out of poor old Joe. So life goes this way, but where are the roots of this thing? They're not in this good old Joe estimation that we have. They go very far back into the most atavistic recesses of existence. They go back to the earth and the stars and the air and all of these things. The roots of this problem are far deeper than we can ever reach. And if it's hard for us to ever understand Joe, it is harder for Joe ever to understand himself. So we come upon him and his problems. And the idea that he is simply a piece of paper with a pattern on it, which we can erase and put another pattern in its place, is wrong. It is not this way. Nor is it a pattern in which we can say to Joel, this particular habit of yours is doing you no good, why not cultivate one that will do you good? So he sincerely tries, and he's more miserable than he was in the first place. The pattern is so complicated that whether it is our own or someone else's, there is no direct, head-on attack which will succeed in actually varying or altering the basic temperament of the person. Now, the person can have many temperaments, but they can be divided perhaps into three general classifications. He can have a tenth temperament that is essentially cheerful, in which good cheer will be victorious over dilemma. He has an essentially melancholy temperament, in which things will always seem a little dark or dismal to him. And optimism will be a very difficult attitude which he cannot maintain continuously. Then there will be others, a third group, which seems to be a sort of middle group, in which things that happen have very little apparent effect at all. This person can live long and learn nothing. He can go through all kinds of experiences and not become aware of any pattern in any of them. And he may be sufficiently superficial so that to him nothing becomes very good or very bad. To try to get at this, then, means a very careful estimation of our own character and a determination to approach it, not head-on to a difficulty, but in the realization of this compound problem. A compound is totally altered if any of its elements be changed. And a compound is something in which you do not have to destroy the compound to change it. 
any change alters the compound. And if the compound is made up of a hundred elements, and you change one of these elements, the other ninety-nine remaining the same, still the compound is changed. This is a very important point, it seems to me, in working with people. We have tried to make great big plans. We have set out patterns and procedures. And we say, this individual should start by taking hold of this problem, or that problem. So we try to indoctrinate, and we try to encourage, and we try to enlighten. And things go on very much the same. Because every person is defensive in his belief that whatever he believes is so. And while he may be forced to admit that his judgment isn't the best, it's hard to get him to admit that a painful experience was not painful. He will tell you he knows more about it than you do. It happened to him. If, on the other hand, you can begin this problem with dispositional subjects, of breaking through the shells of compounds, helping them to be reorganized on other levels. Now, you may be reasonably satisfied with your own temperament. It may be getting you by fairly well. But there are very few persons whose dispositions or attitudes could not be improved in some way. And I think we should bear in mind that this program of improvement, in some way, has much to do with the program of happiness which we hope to enjoy. Few persons are as happy as they theoretically believe that they could be. They are living on levels of contentment that fall short of happiness. Perhaps they are living on a level of patience, an acceptance level. They are not doing what they want to do, but they're trying to be grateful that they're getting by. All such persons could certainly be happier if they went to work on the matter industriously. Also, we have a certain area of defense Again, certain areas of pressure. An individual who is an habitual liar, for example, has a tremendous defense. He has been called a liar so often. He has called himself that in the quietude of his own thinking so often that he builds a, an almost impervious capsule around the entire pattern that is causing the trouble. He will fight to the death to prevent anyone from breaking that up. Not consciously, maybe he wants to recover, but it is like a very sore place on the body. And when the physician tries to rub that sore area, we tell him not to rub too hard. And uh, the discomfort that arises from attacking a fault at its very core is too great for most people. They begin to wince and uh, they don't go back to the physician again if they can help it. So it is much easier not to make this head-on uh, rush into a difficult pattern. So if you have within yourself any character defect whatsoever, of course I realize that here we're a pretty perfect group of folks, <laughs> outstanding in our attainments. But if there is a vestige, a residual atom that is not quite as it should be, why, well, there's always something we can do about it. Forget this entire head-on into gloom. Forget the fact that everything wrong has happened. Don't try to tell yourself all the time it was just your fault. That won't do it either. You can get so hang-dogged in the presence of yourself 
that uh, you hardly uh, want to keep on living. Forget it all for the moment and begin to think of how the chemist, the chemistry itself can be changed. The nice thing about changing chemistry is the fact that it does not appear to relate directly to your major problems. If, for instance, you've been a little selfish or a little unkind or a little nagging during the years, or if you've judged people a little unwisely, work not on these problems, but on the general enrichment of your life. Psychosis is almost always present in a life that is internally not rich enough. Psychic tensions and pressures and the melancholy mood come as the result of a life that is not sufficiently directive or directed toward interesting or worthwhile achievements. The individual has permitted himself to become weary, permitted himself um, to become lazy to progress. He may be busy every minute, but he's lazy to those things which would help him to solve his problem. So if these problems exist, begin a survey of different values in your life. And the first problem is, where are you getting adequate, creative self-expression? Are you doing interesting, pleasant, and happy things as a result of your own planning to do so? Are you growing by conscious effort every day? If you're not, you're shrinking, whether you know it or not. <laughs> Are you finding means of satisfying your own natural instinct for betterness? for a greater happiness. Don't worry about the 15 things that are wrong. Forget about them for the moment. Forget about the mistakes you are making. Stop blaming yourself for them, even if you know you're to blame. Forget everything except one thing. What are we doing now that is right? What are we doing now that pleases? that brings opportunity, that opens up something. What are we doing this minute that we're proud of? What are we doing that is helping us to grow or know or express more adequately? Make the bid a completely positive one. Have no concern at the moment over all these things that did not work out. Forget the unpleasant relatives. Forget the dishonorable friends. And simply say, what am I doing? What am I holding in my hands? What am I building? What am I creating? What am I planning at this moment that is good? This is the beginning of the setting up of a counter habit a habit that goes in a new direction and the symbol of progress or creativity of the making of things is very important in our own justification of life. Every person is either creating or destroying whether he knows it or not. Any individual who is tearing things down is destroying. Any individual who is tearing himself down is destroyed. Well, in most cases, we don't destroy big things, and we're not always sure we're destroying anything. But take the instinct to destroy and stick it out in front where you can see it. When you criticize another person, you are tearing something. You are tearing it apart. Therefore, take a piece of paper, sit down and look at yourself and tear it up. This is criticism. This is exactly what it amounts to. 
When you criticize a person, you're tearing up your likeness or picture of that person. Sometimes it may help to tear up the picture. It's better to tear up the picture than tear up the person. Very often, if we get rid of the feeling by an action, we don't have it anymore. We write letters telling people what we think of them. We can make a wonderful project out of it as long as we never mail the letters. And many persons have found this a very great help. They got it out of the system. But just as this relieves a certain kind of pressure, so the, con the constructive or positive symbolism uh, creates a new release on a positive level. To create something with the hands is a symbol of creativity. Putting a model ship together shows a tendency to integrate. Here is an interesting problem that I think many people have actually fallen into without realizing it. And that is the hobby shop and uh, the various rather complicated uh, things that are manufactured now for persons to assemble on their own time. Twenty-five years ago, about all you could find or put together was an occasional jigsaw puzzle. Today you have hundreds of different model structures. And maybe we think that these belong to the world of childhood. But if they do, so do we. And our own growing up is not as real as we thought it was. But wherever, symbolically, we follow the instructions in a book or on a sheet of paper, and we carefully and orderly and neatly and as nicely as we can assemble a model airplane or a copy of the Mayflower or some other sailing ship of the Viking period, Wherever we put these things together, paint them and finish them, and finally hang them on the mantle or put them somewhere where no one on earth will admire them anyway, yet we have done something. We have used a creative symbolism to put something together. We have developed the continuity to stay with it and do it. We have had an opportunity to use our hands, an opportunity that has become uh, rather strange to many of us because of the efficiency and the mechanism of our modern world. So by the same device that we see in the Rorschach plot, some dismal thing, we can also become aware in the process of putting something together of the integration process in our own natures. This integration is a putting of the personality together lawfully or according to the rules or the sketch or the outline or the instructions that are given to us. Wherever we have an instinct to build or create, we are safer than when we have an instinct to tear down. Also, the moment we take any impulse or instinct of any kind and transform it into an action, it gains tremendous vitality. Most introverts are non-active. Or, as they themselves say, they are busy inside. Well, you can be very busy inside and be very sick as a result. The release of expression through action has peculiar validity. It is one way of convincing ourselves. The moment we perform an action, the consequence of that action becomes known to us by a reflex of our own sensory perception. We can hope, we can think, we can believe, and it all happens inside. It does not cause a stimulation in the sensory perception gamut. 
But if we are determined to transform an idea into action, we go out and we do something. We decide, for instance, that we will draw a picture. So we take pencil in hand and we draw the picture. And the moment we do so, we see the picture we have drawn with our own eyes, and the image is returned again into our own subjective. Tremendous intensification of impact results from the fact that our picture comes back to us again through the outward sensory reflexes. If he gets this concept, he's going to then try and interpret his own pictures, which may and only lead him into further complications. What we are trying to imply, rather, is that just as we arrive at certain conclusions which we do not rationalize, but which cause us to get into trouble, so we can arrive at certain other conclusions which we do not rationalize, but which will get us out of trouble. And the grand pattern of these is so simple that almost anyone can recognize them. Namely, that these patterns must not offend us, that they must advance our creativity, our ingenuity, they must create interests which cause us to want to finish them. And having so accomplished, perhaps lure us on to do more of the same. As we change in many ways, or in any one of many ways, we observe that the psychic compound changes. One healthy interest may affect a complete personality complex. One new attitude, not relating directly to the problems we are suffering from, may help us to cure those problems. The development of a hobby may reintegrate a totally unbalanced life. The individual never attacks any of his vices. He simply finds something constructive and interesting and the vices starve to death, which is the only way to get rid of them. This means that in broad formula, re remedy is always an outgrowing of the ailment. And the outgrowing of a negative attitude is rather easy because there is really no direction you can move from the bottom except up. When you get down as far as you can go, that's it. There is only one other direction. And as almost any action will represent growth when confronted with the opposite of no action, we find a wide variety of possibilities and opportunities offered to us to improve a situation. Always try to compensate for an intensity by a constructive action that takes our mind off of the intensity. Someone will say, well, I'll never get my mind off of this intensity. This one is really something. And we will watch them fight to hold their mind to that intensity. And sometimes you can't get it off. So it is again important to have these persons come in contact with new situations. An example of this... Um, was a person who was extremely depressed by a restricted home environment. This home environment came as the result of retiring from business and the general feeling that they were too old to accomplish anything. So they settled down for several years, becoming more and more melancholy, critical, hypercritical, negative, and fussy. And perhaps the fussy part was the worst. Uh, all the talking in the world did not do anything about it. What actually corrected the whole situation was a chance conversation with another person. And it wasn't a reforming conversation at all. This other person said, I'm at this time trying to rent a house. I have a house for rent. 
I wonder if you'd be so kind as to go over for an afternoon and watch it for me, because I can't be there. This is the thing that started the change in temperament. It had nothing to do with fussiness or negation as we know it. It was simply a physical action. The individual went out and watched the house and interviewed persons who wanted to rent the house. From this experience came the sudden realization inside of this tired, fussy person that he was just bored, had nothing to do. He enjoyed that afternoon. Pretty soon he found other things that he could do of a similar nature, and in a few months he was considerably improved. He had by accident hit upon the answer namely that he needed something to occupy his mind and time. He couldn't figure how to find it himself, so it was shown to him. And having once experimented with it, his enthusiasm increased, and he worked out a program. So this friend, wanting him to sit around and rent an apartment, attacked the foundations of a rapidly developing melancholy and broke the pattern. So all kinds of things can break these patterns. So about all we have to do is expose ourselves to some kind of a program of improvement. Forget about the fact that we are friendless and begin to take an interest in something that we can do. Take an interest in some art or science. Take an interest in some a charitable or sociable activity. Don't try to attack the negative area. Leave it alone and build positive activity. Now many persons believe that they can philosophize themselves into a state of grace. I am a little doubtful of it after so long a time of watching this thing work out. I do not believe that anyone can read himself out of a neurosis. First of all, he won't, because he won't read the right books. The first book that offends his neurosis will go into the wastebasket. <laughs> He's got to read a certain kind of book. It's like a psychotic watching television. He's never happy unless he's got a psychotic program tuned in. You could not sell him a travelogue for a moment. He will tell you that television programs are nothing but crime, and then he will watch nothing else. I've seen people twist the dials away from tremendously interesting programs, even while they're complaining about there not being any interesting programs and end up with a good old murder. And at the same time, complain to the neighbors and everyone else that they shouldn't have no murders on television. There is no way of answering some of these situations, except that an individual trying to find solace for a frustration generally needs to break out from, from himself rather than go back in again. His books, he will identify himself with the wrong character in almost every instance in fiction. Or he will begin to try to build escape and defense mechanisms based upon abstractions that he doesn't understand. He will try to run away from reality into a world of psychic mysteries, which certainly will keep him intellectually occupied, but will leave him in a complete daze when he gets through with it. I doubt very much if any such program can substitute for a good, straight, heart-to-heart -heart talk with ourselves. I doubt if any amount of abstract uh, solace derived from mystical overtones of things can compensate for our failures to actually live optimistically, or live creatively and constructively. There may be cases in which um, these readings and these abstractions can bring comfort under certain pressures or stress. 
but they cannot be and never will be a substitute for life. You've got to live it. And you have to achieve your victory not in an abstraction, but in a concretion. One of the dangers with abstraction uh, is that it enables an individual to weigh his own case unfairly. In abstraction, we can devise our own private universe. We can set it up with our own rules. We can decide in our own minds what is good and what is bad. We can make little heroes out of ourselves in relations to a private cosmos. We can devise all kinds of theories to explain the various incidents of life. And by the time we get through, we have completely lost contact with a real world. I remember this so well in connection with a number of religious and philosophical communities which I have investigated. These people decide that they will go down into the southeast corner of the Argentine and start a new world brotherhood community. Well, I'll give it six months and the world brotherhood will have a civil war. <laughs> These good people wanting to run away from the world and all of its problems and stress to set up the ideal community in Timbuktu have overlooked one difficult problem. There is nothing more terrible, tragic, or incredible in life than a group of good people trying to live together. <laughs> because there are so many unpleasant and uncomfortable ways of being good. <laughs> For most persons, good involves the right to censor the conduct of everyone else that lives. And uh, good people are forever being hurt, disillusioned, disappointed, in other people who are not so good. And the not-so-good people are having a very difficult time with the good ones. <laughs> so the community fails. It fails because people cannot run away from life. And if they get in some isolated situation or a very different and uh, remote area, then they have nothing left to do but think of themselves and each other and gossip from morning till night. This situation goes for the person who tries to go inside of himself, build a private universe, leave the world behind, and try to be very beautiful in spite of everything that is happening. He can't do it. It will not operate. It will not function in society. The only thing he can do is to start in this gentle program of creating a new series of symbols until he is able to look at the design in the Rorschach ink block and see something smiling at him instead of glowering at him as it did the first time he looked. That is the basis of his recovery, is that gradually the universe looks better. People look better. Situations look better. Now, you can't be a blind optimist. We know perfectly well that we are heavily laden with problems. We also know, however, that most of these problems are beyond us as individuals. Therefore, worrying about them is merely an escape mechanism. And I think it is true, whether we like to acknowledge it or not, that many of the people who are worried over the cosmos, worried over the bomb, worried over the smog, worried over all kinds of things they can do nothing about as individuals, are really developing tight little escape mechanisms. They are going to worry about something that is big and that they can do nothing about because they do not want to face themselves now and worry about the things they could do something about. It's wonderful to live in the presence of something so big that anything you can do is useless. 
and people I have heard who have nothing on their minds except the, the constant pressure of social problems are also people who should have much more of their mind on their own dispositions which are usually in terrible shape. <laughs> but it's interesting to have no time left to think about yourself because you're worrying so much about cosmic uncertainties. Let's watch that a little bit and realize that there is much more to be gained for us by turning our attention constructively to one fault of our own than there is in 24 hour a day vigil for the next 50 years worrying about the miseries of mankind. One is so completely futile that it offers no inducement to the practical individual. Whatever we do think about, whatever plans we do make, whatever concerns do burden us, should lie within the range of possible attainments. We should not give much time to a situation which is completely beyond our capacity to influence. The only way we can influence a collective is by gradually making ourselves a positive unit in the collective. For collective problems, our own individual achievement is our only offering. The collective is made up of persons like ourselves. And if each of those persons would take care of his own nature, the collective would look much better. Thus, the only answer in every instance lies that our first step is always the clearing of our own position in relationship to life. Around us today, there are numerous opportunities for activities. There are numerous levels on which we can go to work. There are things that every person can do that will create changes in his psychic integration. Most of these changes arise from self-improvement. Self Therefore, sometimes it is necessary to take a look around and see what can be done in this direction. Almost any form of advanced knowledge gives the person an instrument of skill or of self-directive, or at least of constructive interest. I know friends who have taken weaving, for example, not because they expected to make cloth by the hundred yards, that wasn't the primary motive, but in the study of hand skill they have suddenly opened a universe to themselves. These people are now studying the methods used in Peru in ancient times, or by the Mayas, or by the Copts of Egypt. Their, their weaving has led them into symbolism, into the preparation of dyes, into all the different processes by which religious or other designs evolved within a people, meanings, uh, textile secrets that have been comparatively lost, like the famous Tyrian dyes, which have been so completely lost that we have never been able to secure in the field of dyes what we might call a constant or permanent purple. The color always fades out. With the Tyrians it did not. Twenty years ago we repainted half the murals down in Central America. Our paint's all gone, but the paint that they put on two thousand years ago is still there. This challenges people. Now you can say, well, the world can get along without the paint. After all, when we've got a real worry on our minds, why bother about paint? It is true, the world can get along without uh, a hobby or without going into these things, but can we? It is far better for us to be exploring the origin of primitive dyes than it is to be quietly and in re relentlessly killing ourselves with negative attitudes. We need an interest. 
Actually, it is hard to determine what interest is actually important. For like the Rauschuk test, the only interest that is important is the one that interests us. Some people feel that they cannot afford to have small interests in a big world. They'll have to because we are all small people. And we're going to have small interests as long as we're here. And it is very important for us to have interests. And it is not a tribute to life to decline small interests and live with big miseries. And you'd be surprised how a small interest can cure a big misery. The moment dynamic is born in us, we have no longer the time for static. We begin to direct our activity. And it is also interesting, if you want to really be serious about it, the percentage of great discoveries that have changed the course of history that have been made by amateurs. The professional is not the discoverer, because he is in a rut. He is following tradition. He is going along according to the slow, ponderous methods of his subject. It is some perfect stranger with little experience that will find the solution. It's much like the truck that was stuck in a tunnel in New York. They had all the experts there. The truck was stuck. It was a couple of inches bigger than the tunnel and was in terrible shape. They couldn't move it at all. Then along came someone who had no knowledge of tunnel construction and no knowledge of trucks. He looked the situation out and said, Do you ever think of taking the air out of the tires? <laughs> That's how they got the truck out of the tunnel. Someone comes along with an idea. And whenever we are interested in anything, we're vulnerable to ideas. Ideas that may be small, but others that may change the course of history, we do not know. But we have no ideas while we're sorry for ourselves. If, therefore, we are willing to break through, supposing we do have a life in which we see a dozen different corrections that should be made in character, just let's not worry about them. Let's learn to play a good game of chess. Let's take some interest, music, art, literature, hobbies, crafts. Let's begin regardless of the period of life and go to school again. Not necessarily trundling down the road with the books under one arm. We can do it by extension courses from universities and adult education programs. Learn things. Build things. Work constantly to move knowledge forward. Well, many large communities where there are art galleries and museums have very splendid programs relating to art. Lectures, pictures, exhibitions, tours uh, conducted through the museums. Today in large communities there are cultural events of all kinds. The individual who begins to understand the importance of culture suddenly realizes that it is not measured in pennies and dimes, it is measured in peace of soul, in the ability to become adjusted and to have this adjustment in turn reflect in every performance or action that we indulge. So that as a result of a, a different internal, we are suddenly better friends, better relatives, and more intelligent babysitters. Whatever it is that we are doing becomes a richer experience only if we are richer people in value. And the tremendous cure for all faults is this enriching of life. Now some persons also take the attitude that nearly all such avocational activities are expensive. That in order to be cultured you have to be rich. This is not true. The average person wastes today, more in trivia that produce him nothing than it would take him, uh, than it would cost him to plan a very well-balanced purpose program for personal integration. 
This is the kind of program that will save you the psychologist's fee to start with. Cut down your medical bills. Cut down money wasted desperately in an effort to get out of a mood. Or money wasted because you were in the mood when you bought something you didn't need and didn't want. With a very moderate expenditure, an individual can develop interests that will enable him to become positive to something. Positive to something that is not personal, and that is very important. Positive to a neutral thing. In other words, it makes, it faces him with another Rorschach test. But this time it is not an ink blot, but it is an activity which he must interpret and which in turn he is able to modify himself by his own actions. By keeping with this kind of a program quietly, but con with continuity, a person in two or three years can completely reorganize their psychic focus of organization. They will find they become interesting people that others are glad to know. They become interesting to themselves. I know a case at point that is very much to this situation. A man who had insomnia came to me not long ago. He said, if I can't get to sleep at night, I'm just going to blow my brains out. I simply can't stand this insomnia any longer. Lying there hour after hour and not sleeping. Well, it was pretty bad. We did what we could to help him. A few days later, another man came in. We were talking about something, and... The question came up, well, how do you sleep? Oh, he said, I don't sleep much. I guess I have what they call insomnia, but, you know, it doesn't bother me at all. It just gives me more time to think about the things that interest me. <laughs> Difference in attitude. Well, the fact of the matter is that anyone ought to be able to lie awake all night without a negative thought. The only reason he has a negative thought is because he has nothing on his mind. If he can use that time to advance a program, think something through that he wants to do, plan for things of the future, remember beautiful or wonderful things that have happened to him, or relive delightful and inspiring experiences, or just simply muse quietly about values and principles that are important. Any individual should be able to do this. But today an individual misses a little sleep and he has to take sedation because he can't live with himself. This is not due to the fact he's going to die for lack of sleep. Nature will never permit this. It's simply that he makes himself sick. The greater part of the disaster of insomnia is not the lying awake. It is the fact that the person uses this period to slowly but resolutely tear down integration. To become so much more psychic over it that it is a hundred times worse than the loss of sleep. Everywhere in life it is the same. So we have to work on these attitudes, nourishing them with better food, giving them a diet that is, a, that is suitable to their needs. Every instinct of fear has within it the same energy that is used for hope and faith. Every criticism uses the same faculties and problems of analysis that can also give us commendation. Every bit of depression is using the same negative reaction to energy for which a positive reaction is optimism and courage. There is only one life principle and we are using it or abusing it all the time. When we use it, it makes us happy. When we abuse it, it makes us miserable. And when we are in habits that are too hard to break and too difficult to head into and just fight them day by day, we have this wonderful opportunity of forgetting about the bad ones and begin building new good ones. 
building them slowly and patiently, not frightening ourselves to death or wearing ourselves to death, but building quietly a positive life. And if we will do this, the old negative life will be submerged in it and lost. Thus we transform the whole pattern and come in the end to a much better level of energy support. A good pattern is like nutrition, a happy project, something that makes us really enjoy life is far more valuable to us than vitamins. Very often we use vitamins only to sustain our melancholy. They give us the rich vitality with which to be uncomfortable and unpleasant. Actually, if we are doing things that we love and enjoy and make sense to us, we have our energy. This constant deflation of energy is largely boredom. Largely the individual unhappy because life is meaningless. So we supply pills to keep meaningless people going. What is more important is to supply meaning. Then people can keep themselves going. And you can run a good hobby on what you pay for pills these days. So get, try to get hold of this idea of simply building a new self, a new purpose of self. Using only such good parts of the old as are adaptable, but definitely striving to work out an interest and permitting no one to defeat you. Don't worry about the obstacle. Don't worry about the fact that the first line of interest may not be the final one. Break through anything that will help you to have new insight, new interest, new knowledge, new positive conversation and new constructive thinking. Then just work with those new patterns. And in time, you will create a new world. And the universe around you will look better. The people you work with will look better. And you will look a lot better when you look in the mirror. There is nothing like reintegration on constructive patterns for psychological facelifting. It will do tremendous things. And we just don't fight these problems anymore. Just build something good. And just let the problems die of neglect. If you will do that, I think you will find it will bring positive and useful and profitable results to yourself and those who you want to make happy or who depend upon you for inspiration and guidance. Time's up, so I have to